Hello there, welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world, and so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you very much. And I am so delighted you've joined me this evening for a fabulous story. And I hope you're going to go and get yourself something marvellous to drink. And if it's something unusual, let me know about it, because I love hearing from you. And also, it's so good for the algorithms if you leave a comment. If the algorithms pick up that you've enjoyed the story, they recommend me more. So that all helps a great deal. And let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah, and all your lovely listeners, after spending many hours fastidiously scrubbing and cleaning Mrs. Anna Wingborn's immaculate kitchen, I was finally fully satisfied that I'd done my job well and good. But who was I kidding? Even before I'd started polishing the meticulously clean granite surfaces that had been so shiny that I could practically see my own reflection in them. In truth, this large, grandiose kitchen looked as if it had never been used a day in its life, and I suspected as much. The only thing I ever needed to wash were random empty coffee mugs that would gather around the sparkling Frankie kitchen sink like lost orphans that had been cruelly abandoned. Sometimes there were a few crystal wine glasses smeared with lipstick lying haphazardly around the house, in obscure places like around the rim of the large luxurious bathtub or hidden discreetly under the bed. The odd plate would be found covered with a scattering of crumbs. And, of course, the Beatrix Potter china bowls used for the baby's food that always required washing. Why Mrs. Wingbore needed my services for a job that could take her less than 15 minutes to do herself was beyond me. But Anna Wingbourne liked to have a housemaid in her employ. I guess it added to the prestige of being a wealthy New York housewife. I'd been working in her fancy penthouse apartment in the upper west side of Manhattan with stunning views over the Hudson River a piece of prime real estate that came with a hefty price tag for over two years. In truth, the fabulously elegant kitchen looked like something on display in an unblemished show house. It was the crazy and practical size of an Olympic swimming pool with a sprawling marble floor and exquisite islands of gorgeous top-of-the-range granite with built-in cupboards that had been superbly handmade and painted pristinely in white. I mean, honestly... Does anyone need a kitchen this size? Anna Wingborn clearly did. I do not believe that the navy blue stunning range oven had ever been used a day in its life. I doubted Anna Wingborn even knew how to switch the damn thing on. I'd seen her try to heat up some soup once in a little pot over the stove, and she was completely out of her depth. I had to show her how to turn on the gas hob, and when I was trying to explain to her how to use it, she looked completely befuddled as if I was trying to explain to her how to figure out a long-drawn-out mathematical equation. Let's just say a self-entitled woman like Mrs. Wingborn would rarely be lost if she had to fend for herself on a desert island and try and cook over an open fire and kill her own food. Even the mere idea would probably horrify her. I often tried to imagine that kind of scenario in my own head, and a huge smile would develop on my face, not because I was being mean, but it would be funny to watch her in circumstances like that, as I don't think Anna Wingborn would fare favourably. She would be like a fish out of water. She did not have that natural inbuilt survival instinct most of us naturally acquire, based on our life experiences. She was so used to depending on others to do things for her. In truth, she had little idea how to manage her own life independently, which was an awful pity if you ask me. I was to learn that she'd grown up in a very luxurious lifestyle, so that since she was a wee little tiny tot, her mother never allowed her to do a thing. She hinted that she had some kind of a lady's maid, who dressed her up for school and attended to her every need. Oh, I was so lucky! Growing up, she boasted to me once very proudly, my mother never let me lift a single finger, never allowed me to ever get my hands dirty. I don't even know how to make a bed, she had giggled, lowering her voice into a low whisper, as if she didn't want anyone else to hear her dirty little secret. In truth, I was appalled by her stunning revelation, for I had never thought in our modern-day 21st century that people like Anna Wingborn existed, but believe me, they do. I've met some of her friends, and they're as spoilt as she is, a unique breed, you could say, 
It's almost like those glamorous, very wealthy women from the 18th century who grew up with ladies' maids and governesses that you think had died out a long time ago, like the dinosaurs, have made their appearance in a select few in our society. Mrs. Wingborn's kitchen boasted all kinds of fabulous accessories, like a top-of-the-range ice cream maker, a navy blue KitchenAid, Magi Mix, a deep fat fryer, and so many other glamorous bits and bobs that you might well expect to find in an illustrious upmarket restaurant or in the homes of a world-renowned chef like Gordon Ramsay. Everything in that kitchen possessed the unused look, as if all the gadgets and accessories had only just been removed from their cellophane packaging so that the sterile kitchen lacked that lived-in cosy look. It looked as if all the superfilious kitchen gadgets were displayed on the kitchen countertops more for show, as if to pointedly suggest that Anna herself was some kind of domestic goddess, when nothing could be further from the truth. But she could dream, I suppose. Maybe she wanted all her friends to believe she was a great cook. Who knows? I was highly sceptical that Anna knew how to even boil an egg. She was the kind of woman who'd enjoyed the perks of having everything done for her her entire life. The kitchen was a showstopper, and the first time I laid eyes on it, I was completely bowled over by it. For my kitchen at home was so tiny, you could barely swing a cat in it, and my tatty linoleum floors and warped, decrepit, cardboard-like cupboards were literally hanging off their hinges. They threatened to break apart when you merely opened them, and were not exactly very impressive. I doubted Mrs. Wingbourne had cooked a single thing in that kitchen. The evidence was so clear to see in her bin, which was regularly littered with the sorrowful abandoned carcasses of leftover fast food cartons from restaurants in the local area, like Chinese noodles, sweet and sour chicken, tagliatelle with bolognese pasta, and barbecue spare ribs. The list goes on. When you looked inside her refrigerator, everything was pre-cooked and ready to eat. The kitchen did not possess the things you'd expect to find in a well-stocked pantry, like flour, baking powder, cream, cheese, rice, pasta, spices, pulses, or canned goods, which was a dreadful shame, because if you wanted to cook in that magnificent kitchen, it sure would help to have some basic ingredients. The one thing the kitchen had was an inbuilt wine cellar that was kept perfectly cool at the ideal temperature and contained some excessively expensive wines. The priggish, rather brash Mrs. Wingbourne was in her early thirties and was on the verge of divorcing her husband George. I could see why. I mean, what man could put up with a woman like her, who had only concerns over one person in her life, and that was herself? Nothing beyond herself mattered. She was the quintessential megalomaniac. In successful marital relationships, people have to learn to be sacrificial, to look out for their partner for the relationship to flourish and thrive. Anna Wingborn knew not the meaning of the word sacrifice. It was as alien to her as a lettuce leaf is to a lion. From the moment I met her, I knew she was one of the most spoilt people I had ever had the privilege to meet. Before I met her, I did not believe people like her actually existed. But believe me, they do. Greta, where on earth are you? comes the indignant voice as Mrs. Wingborn finally floats into the kitchen, like a yellow butterfly hovering over a field of poppies. As usual, she looks pretty close to perfect in one of her sleek designer creations, of which she has many, far too many to count. Mrs. Wingborn has a dressing room with perfectly colour-coordinated rails and ubiquitous shelves meticulously laid out and arranged, bursting with the top-of-the-range designer clothes and hundreds and hundreds of designer shoes. Some of them, much like her kitchen appliances, have failed to see the light of day or have even succeeded in drawing breath. The glamorous dress she's wearing today is as yellow as a canary, with a plunging neckline and a pleated full skirt that flares at the bottom, accentuating her slender ankles. On her feet, she's wearing fancy yellow shoes, with an interesting alignment of weave straps around the front of the foot that I remember admiring in a designer shoe shop a few days earlier in Fifth Avenue, but when I saw the price tag, I nearly fainted on the spot. Those shoes cost more money than I earn in a year. The yellow colour of Anna's dress that day was particularly fetching, especially complimentary to her long shiny black hair, 
that fell below her bust, along with her fair porcelain complexion, that had undergone hundreds of beauty treatments to keep it looking as smooth as a baby's bottom. She had jars and jars of the most expensive creams you can buy in her bathroom, all earnestly promising to hold back the years. Some of the creams said things on the back like Botox in a jar and skin rejuvenation, taking the scientific world by storm. Even though Anna was young, she was pumping her skin with Botox so she couldn't even move her forehead, a fact she was extremely proud about. Prevention is so much better than cure, she had told me. You stop the wrinkles before they make an appearance. It's called thinking ahead. Oh, there you are, Greta, she said in an accusatory tone of voice that suggested that I was not where she expected to find me. Why did you not answer me, Greta? I mean, I ask you, why don't you call out when I'm calling your name? It's terribly annoying when you don't answer me. Very impolite. Did your mother never teach you any manners growing up? Mrs. Wingborn's eyes narrowed stubbornly as she looked at me with a judgmental look that had parked itself on her face that she did not attempt to hide. I'm sorry, Mrs. Wingborn, I apologised. Sorry is not good enough, Greta, she snorted. When I call you, I expect you to answer me. I can't go trotting from one room to another just looking for you. This is a large penthouse, you know, and I'm not an aspiring athlete. Besides, I don't want to ruin my clothes by breaking out into an ugly sweat. Do you have any idea how sweat could ruin the fabric of this dress? And I assure you, a dress like this did not come along cheap. I apologise for that, Mrs. Wingborn. I was just getting ready to leave. I've tidied up, put the washing away, done the shopping for you, collected your dry cleaning. I brought the fragra and the caviar you wanted from that specialised shop. I've put it in the refrigerator for you. Little Petra is fast asleep in the nursery. I took her with me to the shops in her pram. She was very well behaved, I'm glad to say. They all said she was adorable. Well, said Mrs. Wingborn, looking pleased. Of course she's adorable. She's a splitting image of her mother, isn't she? The same thing happened to me when I was a wee little one. My mother was always stopped in the street, people incessantly telling her that I was the most beautiful baby they'd ever seen in their entire lives. I gave Mrs. Wingborn a watery smile. If she was given a chance to brazenly boast about anything, she would get onto her pedestal and harp on about how wonderful her family line was and how it could be traced back to the royalty. I need to go, Mrs. Wingborn, I said, making a gesture to leave. Mrs. Wingborn raised her hand in the air, in that same gesture when a lollipop lady at a pedestrian crossing needs you to stop. So I knew she was trying to silence me and prevent me from leaving the penthouse. This was all I needed. I inwardly groaned. Not so fast, Greta dear, said Mrs. Wingborn. Not so fast. You can't possibly go now. I've got things for you to do. I need you to stay here. I want you to look after Petra for a few more hours. It's terribly urgent, you see. I cringed as Anna tells me this. My heart sinks into my chest. I work for her six mornings a week, and when I'm not there, someone else stands in for me on my days off or on the times I'm not available to work. A long-suffering elderly woman called Rose Bartlett, who Mrs. Wingborn finds annoyingly slow. Of course, Rose Bartlett is a very sweet, dear woman, she told me once, but oh my word, she is so dreadfully slow. But at least she's very good with little Petra, which is why I won't get rid of her. And thank goodness, Greta, that I have you to take care of this penthouse. One of my jobs among many was to supervise and babysit Petra, her little one-year-old daughter, who was absolutely adorable. I had been working for the Wingborns for over two years. What Anna Wingborn conveniently seemed to forget is I had my own life to live, beyond taking care of her penthouse and her little girl. I was doing an online course at Fort Hayes State University Virtual College, an MBA in Nursing Administration as I have aspirations beyond just being an easily exploited housemaid. But how could I expect the likes of Anna Wingborn, who had the hide of a rhinoceros and the sensitivity of a gnat, to appreciate that? The course did not come cheap, but it was affordable, and as far as I was concerned, an invaluable investment to the future, to better myself 
and to give me greater opportunities in life, beyond just cleaning, cooking and babysitting for other people. Yet in the same breath, I also didn't want to alienate Anna Wingborn. I couldn't afford to do that. I needed this job which paid incredibly well. I really wanted to focus on my studies if at all possible. But Anna Wingborn had made it close to impossible for me, with all her incessant fortuitous demands that were given to me at a moment's notice, without any advance warning. She seemed to expect me to abandon all my plans at the drop of a hat, as anything she needed me to do was way more important than any of my frivolous, somewhat facetious studies that she saw as very inconsequential. It had been significantly easier when her husband George had been around, as Mr. Wingborn was a very reasonable, judicious man, and he would subdue his wife's excessive demands on me by putting her in her place and reminding her that I deserved to have some free time. But now his soon-to-be rather cranky, very opinionated ex-wife had become more and more obstinately disobliging, without her husband to rein her in. Unfortunately, I watched poor Mr. Wingborn walking out of his marriage six months prior with a melancholic acquiescence. I guess he was resigned to the fact that his marriage, like the Titanic, had hit an iceberg and was rapidly sinking to the bottom of the ocean. He was a wise, sagacious man who knew when to walk away from a shipwreck that could not be salvaged. On the morning he walked out on Anna Wingborn for good. He had been pointing his fingers accusingly at his wife. It was like watching a dramatic scene on the stage of a theatre unfold before your very eyes, with two leading actors who knew how to play their roles to perfection. "'God knows why I married you, Anna!' he lashed out at her. At the time I was washing mugs in the kitchen sink, and couldn't fail to hear the explosive argument between the affronted couple. "'Anna, I have had enough of your whinging, your whining, your incessant moaning. "'You're the most self-entitled, spoiled brat I have ever known. "'You weren't like this when we first got married. "'But I guess you were showing your best side to me, "'to persuade me that you weren't remotely like your mother. "'Your father warned me about you. "'He told me it was your way or the highway.' There was no room for negotiation. He wasn't wrong about that, was he? I should have listened to his wizened advice. He said you were as bumptiously overbearing and as difficult as your mother. Two peas in a pod were the exact words he used. He told me why he left your mother all those years ago. She was a nightmare to live with, demanding, self-centred, pretentious, cavalier, snooty. Very spoilt. It seems that the apple does not fall far from the tree, does it? I've had enough of you presumptuously making every decision under our roof without my intervention. Do you have any idea how demasculating it is for me to have you taking charge over every decision in this household? It's an embarrassment, that's what it is. You are so bombastically condescending at times. You make me feel like a naughty boy. I'm a fully grown man, for God's sake. How can I be romantic with someone who behaves like a mother to me? We're supposed to be in an equal partnership, Anna. But I feel you're the one impertinently calling out all the shots, high-handedly saying what's what. In the circumstances, I cannot remain under this roof with you for a moment longer. I love you, Anna, but I don't like you very much. That's a huge problem for me. I feel as if I'm going to bed with my enemy, and my mother conjoined every night of the week. We are always at each other's throats, bickering. Sometimes you are so insufferable, I feel as if I can't breathe. The only thing you care about in our marriage is yourself. You've made that appallingly clear. Even discussing the prospect of more children or a sister or brother for little Petra and you're whinging about getting a few more stretch marks or struggling with a few excess pounds that you need to lose. For God's sake, Anna, get your priorities right. Stop sounding so pathetic. How dare you? Anna had shrieked like a banshee. How dare you? You don't know what it's like being a woman. You try having babies yourself. See how that would make you feel. My body has already taken a very large beating. 
I do care about you, George, but I told you I'm not having any more children. If you think that I'm lordly, you've only got yourself to blame for that. If you keep behaving like a silly little boy, how do you expect me to treat you? Now let's talk about this. Don't be so damn unreasonable. George Wingbourne strutted past his wife, looking frustrated. His shoulders were slumped, his posture deflated. He looked dog-tired and wary, like a man who'd run a marathon and finally collapsed from a defeated exhaustion. Let's make this very clear, Anna. This is not about having another baby. This goes deeper than that. You're using your desire to not have a sister or brother for Petra as an excuse. This is about your stinky attitude, your selfishness. You'll be hearing from my lawyers. I want a divorce. You bastard! You bastard! cried Mrs. Wingbourne. You bastard! I hate you! Now get out! I never want to see you ever again! How dare you talk to me like this? Don't you worry. I'm going. Mr. Wingbourne came into the kitchen very briefly to retrieve his car keys that were on the kitchen island. He looked at me apologetically, straightening his tie that had become slightly lopsided. I'm very sorry, Greta. You didn't need to hear all that. I didn't mean for you to observe our dirty laundry, he said bashfully. Don't worry about me, Mr. Wingbourne, I said politely, giving him a sympathetic look. I felt really sad that the couple could not repair and fix up their differences, but I could tell by the determined, resolute expression on Mr. Wingbourne's face that it really was over between him and his wife. There was no coming back from this. In truth, he looked like he'd gone through the paper shredder in his office, and he was battle-weary, and his hopes for the future crushed like an insect being pulverized under a stone. I understood why he'd had enough of Anna. For a long time I'd secretly ruminated over how such a nice man could have fallen for the likes of Mrs. Wingbourne, whom in my book was probably one of the most unlikable, cantankerous, crabby and difficult women to be married to, as indeed she was to work for. If that wasn't bad enough, she had such exacting standards, and if you didn't measure up she'd spit you out contemptuously. In truth I'd expected her relationship to fall apart with her husband George but I never anticipated that her long-suffering husband would be the one that would end things. I thought it would be the other way around. I watched Anna Wingbourne standing there in a stunned silence, as she watched her debonair husband in his smart blue and white pinstripe suit, crisp pale blue dress shirt, and shiny black handcrafted Italian leather shoes, march out of his penthouse with a defiant swing to his step and a fiery look in his grey eyes. For a moment Anna looked as if someone had hit her across the face with a baseball bat. Her skin paled, her top lip quivered, her eyes glistened, and her whole body trembled, and finally she managed to compose herself, as Anna Wingbourne was good at bearing her emotions. "'Did you see that, Greta?' she said indignantly. "'My husband bloody walked out on me, because I told him I didn't want any more children. Can you believe it? I tell you, Greta, that man does not deserve me. I will make damn sure he never sees little Petra ever again. He will rue the day he ever walked out on us. You mark my words. I'll make him live with regret. See if I don't. But are you sure, Mrs. Wingbourne, that that is a good idea? I said, trying to offer her some well-meaning advice. When Petra grows up, if you deny her access to her father, she could end up hating you. Surely you don't want that to happen. Anna Wingbourne looked disgruntled. She almost hissed at me. Excuse me, Greta. I'd like to remind you that you are the housemaid and the babysitter, are you not? Now it's not for you to pass judgment on how I raise my child. If I want your advice, I will ask you for it. I would thank you kindly for not interfering into my personal business. You saw the outrageous, dismissive way that George was treating me. Honestly, that loathsome husband of mine does not deserve to see his daughter ever again. My decision is final, and it's not up for negotiation. Do you understand, Greta? And more besides, what happens between me and my soon-to-be ex-husband George has absolutely nothing to do with you. That was me, well and truly put in my place. I shook my head, 
choosing not to tell Mrs. Wingborn that her husband George would likely take her to court over the matter, as that man adored little Petra, and had just as much right to see his daughter grow up as his wife did. In truth, Anna Wingborn did not devote much attention to little Petra, even though she considered herself to be a good mother. That, in my opinion, was very debatable. Of late, Anna Wingborn had been insisting I babysit little Petra, as ever since her husband had left her, she was demanding my services all the more. Of course I loved babysitting her little girl. Ever since I turned thirty, I had become what some people might call broody. I only have to look at a baby and go completely mushy and weak at the knees. Anna Wingborn's daughter was one of the cutest little one-year-olds I'd ever seen, with bouncy blonde curls and wide blue eyes, the kind of perfect baby you would see in a baby catalogue. It was always a pleasure looking after little Petra, but working for Mrs. Wingborn certainly was not. But as my old mother used to say, beggars cannot be choosers, and I knew my place. Every day I would walk from the insalubrious train station, that stank of stale urine, back to my time-worn, dog-eared one-bedroom apartment in the South Bronx, where I lived on the seventh floor, in a rather decrepit, seedy, disreputable-looking red-brick building. Going home, I'd walk down those unsavoury streets, holding my purse tightly in one hand, and a can of mace in the other, which I kept tucked away discreetly in a pocket with my fingers at the ready, so that I could spring into action if anyone got too close to me, who looked suspiciously like their intentions towards me, were far from good. It had happened once before, when a young man had tried to grab my purse from me, I sprayed him in the face with mace. He rolled up on the ground in a ball, writhing in pain, his eyes weeping and burning. He cursed at me under his breath, as I made my way steadily back home. Obstensively, this unwholesome rough neighbourhood where I resided was at the worst unpredictable, and at the very best unsavoury. I needed to always be guarded, as I lived in the middle of one of the most dangerous, corrupt and sordid neighbourhoods in New York, a dingy, shabby area that was littered with some of the most dubious-looking characters, from drug addicts, dealers, ex-convicts, vagrants, thieves and prostitutes. God forbid if I didn't have the wages Anna Wingborn paid me, I could end up living in a scruffy cardboard box on the street corner, and that bodeful, depressing thought always reminded me that I had to be on my best behaviour with Anna Wingborn. I needed to grit my teeth, bite my lip, and appease the woman, because losing this job was not an option for me, even if I did despise working for someone as capriciously belligerent as she was. In truth, I could not be certain I could get another job terribly easily. I'd been in prison for drink driving once, and was incarcerated for over five years, so with a nasty blight like that against my name, jobs were few and far between. Let's just say potential employers usually did some kind of background check on you and once they knew you had a prison record, they'd spit you out like old chewing gum on the sidewalk. It was tough going to prison at twenty-one years old, for having drunk way too much and being under the influence. I had been incarcerated with some terrifying women, who were responsible for murder, drug dealing, robberies, violent crimes, and some of those women were a hell of a scary, the kind of woman I never believed would ever cross my path. But once you're in prison, you find yourself mixing with some unsavoury people. I would never have envisaged that I'd end up in a place like this. But like so many things in life, you never ever think it'll happen to you, until it does. For the first few weeks in prison, it was all so surreal. In the beginning I refused to eat the disgusting slop, until I grew so hungry that I had to eat it unless I wanted to starve. On the brighter side of things, I should have been thankful for small mercies as I got a significantly lighter sentence than others who've been incarcerated for drink driving. By all accounts, prison gave me a bird's eye view of some of the dangerous people that live among us in our society, who on the surface may seem moderately benign, but are anything but. But many of them I clandestinely suspect might have undiagnosed mental conditions, from schizophrenia to bipolar. I was sure of that based on some of my bizarre interactions with some of the prisoners. One prisoner told me how she'd murdered her boyfriend as he cheated on her with another woman. I whacked him over the head with a garden trowel, she told me proudly, with a satisfied smirk on her face. You should have seen him. It was as easy as killing an insect. 
only I had to apply more force. At the time I was doing some weightlifting, so I was quite strong and in better nick than I am now. It's this prison. All the slop has made me so fat, she had said snortingly, patting the rows of accumulative upholstering around her middle. He was begging me to stop, and I said to him, that's what you get for cheating on me. I guess he learnt his lesson, she said. He was unable to cheat on me again. I was appalled that she found what she had done to be extremely funny, and some of the inmates agreed with her, saying that they would do exactly the same to their boyfriends if they had been cheated on. It did not seem to remotely occur to this woman who was called Shelley that she'd be spending the rest of her life behind bars because of what she'd done. She was the female equivalent of a thug, with large muscles, short hair that was spiked on the front of her head, and shaved on the sides. She looked like a woman who was trying to be a man. Her arms were covered in tattoos of ocean mermaids. She had several nose and ear piercings. If I'd seen her on the side of the street, I would have crossed over to the other side, because there was something about her that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up on end. So there we are. That's the end of part one. Part two is tomorrow night. Please join me then. I can't wait for you to join me. Until next time, goodbye and good night.